Greetings in the blessed holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching. For those watching or possibly listening to this program on June 18th of 2022, you are participating in the Kingdom Online Conference being put on by Tearing Down Idols Ministries. I am uh, very honored to be invited to preach this message to you, and I hope that it is a blessing to you. Uh, now, if you're watching this anytime after that, you're probably watching it on YouTube or maybe some other outlet, and I hope the same. Now, in this message, we're going to be discussing the Israel message, or more particularly called the Anglo-Israel message, and you'll understand what I'm talking about later on if you don't. Now, for those that understand what I'm talking about, this may be review to you, but it also may bring out some new things that you didn't know as well. It's good to have a refresher. But for those that are new to this, uh, I think you're going to have some interesting things to think about before the end of this program. Uh, in the Bible, it is very clear that from Genesis to Revelation, there is one group of people that stand out among all the others, and that is the Israel people. And it's very clear that also that the Bible itself is the history of those people, and it's written to those people. And that is very significant. It's significant to who Israel is today. It's significant to uh, us. It's significant to God. It's a very important subject. Now, regarding the identity of these people today in 2022, there's a lot of different theories and doctrines and uh, all kinds of different things to believe about it. And if we truly look to the scriptures, though, to the, the, the identification marks of Israel that are laid out in the scriptures that God gave us, it's really not that hard of a question to answer. And we need to do that. We have to be biblically oriented. We need to look to our scriptures and not let other ideas and thoughts or traditions get in our way. So if you're watching this, I'm asking you, do not listen to this program of me speaking, this, this message, with different thoughts in mind of, yeah, but, because they very well may be traditions. Now, if it's from the Bible, that's fine. There's lots of different questions that I'm not going to be able to answer in this program. But do not approach this subject with traditions and ideas and thoughts that you learn from your denomination or your religion or from school or seminary or your pastor. Truly look to the Word of God and check and see if what I'm saying is so. Check and see if what they're saying is so. Uh, if the Jews be today Israel, then let it be so. But it, Truth doesn't fear investigation. If the church today be Israel, then truth doesn't fear investigation. Or if the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, and Scandinavian people be Israel, then truth does not fear investigation. So, who is true Israel? Well, that's the question we're going to be talking about in this message. The British evangelist George Jeffries, during the early 1900s, he posed a question of three possible answers to the Israel question during his, his ministry. And the first being the Jewish school. And he had it laid out in schools of thought. And he was laying out what people believed during that time uh, in the early 1900s. And today, the three, uh, the three schools I'm going to lay out today we can find in most churches as well. Uh, there's two of them that are very prominent. And then the third one, not so much. But the first one being the Jewish school of thought, being that the Jewish people, the modern Jewish people of today, are the fullness of the descendants of Israel. They are the physical, literal descendants of the Israel people, all 12 tribes, and they are the inheritors of the promises that God made with Abraham and his descendants after him in an everlasting covenant. And that's pretty much the what you would call Judeo-Christianity today, where we have um, Christians that try to intermingle Judaism in with Christianity, creating Judeo-Christianity, which, if you investigate, isn't true Christianity at all. But I would say the bulk of the churches, at least here in America today, believe that the Jews are Israel, without question. The second cool th school of thought would probably make up the majority of the rest of the people, and that is the church school of thought. 
And this school of thought is, uh, it goes by a couple different names, but basically it is that the church, you had the physical Israel in the Old Testament, but after the cross, God changed his mind and quit messing around with the, the physical Israel people, and he has now spiritualized those covenants made with physical Israel. And now anyone that calls themselves a Christian um, or is part of a church, depending on your definition of church, which is another subject, they are Israel. This doctrine is often called replacement theology. It's called spiritual Israelism where basically they spiritualize the Israel to make up anybody. Now, both of this, when it comes to the school, the church, uh, the church school of thought, there's a lot of problems there. And I'm not going to be able to lay them all out, but I think a few of them you're going to flag up in your mind as we go through Genesis chapter 17 in just a minute. But you'll find that there's a big issue with the, the church being a spiritual Israel. There's issues with the Jewish school of thought as well. But without touching on all that, let's go to the third school of thought, which George Jeffers laid out. And that was the Anglo-Israel school of thought. And that is that the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, and Scandinavian, and Celtic, and kindred people were the physical descendants of the Israelites. Now, some... That may sound like an outlandish statement, like oh, how can he, someone believe that? Well, there actually is a lot of evidence to believe that. The problem is, is many people in our society, through political correctness, they, they, they bury it. They don't want to answer those questions. But those that go do the Anglo-Israel school of thought, they believe that those people that make up those people of Europe are the Israel people of the Bible. And then after the Assyrian captivity, those people that were in Assyrian captivity from the northern house of Israel, they migrated northwest through the Caucasus Mountains, through an area over there called the Pass of Israel, which is it's known for, and through the area of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and they uh, migrated up through Europe. And uh, they made up the multitude of nations that would have sprung up out of those people shortly after that. Now there was people in Europe at that time, but it was for the most part pretty vacant. Um, and they moved in there and went by different names. They didn't go by Israelites. They went by different names. Uh, Scythians, for example, and, and other, other names as well, which we'll touch on later on in this message. Um, they believe that and, uh, you know, it's not unwarranted because, you know, when, when after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, where did the gospel go? It went northwest to Europe, to these people that some people believe are the Israelites. And where did the gospel stay for nearly 1,900 years? Um, who are the people responsible for us having this Bible right here? Who are the people whose blood was spilt for us having this Bible bound in the way it is? And so many other things we can go on. But uh, don't let what I'm saying trigger you. and Just think about it. Um, so now let's turn to Genesis chapter 17. And let's discuss the Abrahamic covenant. Now, this is the continuation of the Abrahamic covenant. The first time that God spoke with Abraham, kind of laying out a preview of the Abrahamic covenant, was in, uh, it was in Genesis chapter 12. But we're just going to read chapter 17 and read some of the promises that God made with Abraham and his descendants through Isaac, Jacob Israel, and then the Israelites. So, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, it says this, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am, the, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God spoke with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting 
covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now we'll stop right there. Um, that this covenant that God made with Abraham was with his physical seed, physical descendants. And it was an unconditional covenant. God made the covenant with his people after him through Isaac, Jacob, Israel, and the Israelites with no strings attached. There was no, I'll do this, but you have to do that. And uh, that is very important. This is not to be misunderstood or um, mistaken for the Mosaic Covenant or the Old Covenant made at Mount Sinai with the Israelites, which was a very conditional covenant. This one was an everlasting covenant. And it's very important to understand it was unconditional. Unconditional. As for the Mosaic Covenant, it was conditional. So, let's look at a few clues here to who Israel is through history and today. In verse 2, it says here, And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. So God's saying, I'm going to multiply your seed, your descendants, exceedingly. And we're talking about physical descendants here. No spiritual children here. We're talking about physical in this passage. If you don't believe me, look up the words for seed and descendants, and you will find in the Hebrew, they mean physical flesh and blood beings. There's no spiritual babies going on in this passage in regards to these promises. Now let's read in verse, um, verse 6. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful. Here we go again. God's reiterating it. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful and will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. Now, in these passages here, we have promises of multitude of people and a multitude of nations. And it says here in verse 5, and I will, uh, excuse me, verse 4, And as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations I have made thee. That's very significant. So we know that the Israel population through history will be a multitude of people and a multitude of nations, many nations. Because you, when you have a bunch of people, and you have a bunch of nations, and kings, kings are in this promise as well. So you have a bunch of people, you have a multitude of nations, you have a multitude of kings because you have those nations, rulers. So it's very clear that the Israel people would have an immense population and a multitude of nations, and a multitude of kings to go along with those nations. But to further uh, tag on to that, let's go to Genesis chapter 13, verse 16. And this is God comparing the population of Israel to the dust of the earth. And it says here in Genesis chapter 13, verse 16, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Think about that. God is saying, if someone can number the dust of the earth, they'll be able to multiply your seed, your descendants, physical descendants, throughout history, for however long it goes. Imagine that. Imagine that. Now let's turn to Genesis chapter 28. For a second witness to that, you could say. Genesis chapter 28, and we're going to read in verse 14, and it says here, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 28, verse oh, I'm at 27, 14, and it says here, And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So we have in this passage here, reiterating the fact that they would be the dust of the earth, comparable to the dust of the earth, but they would also migrate north, south, east, and west. Now that's significant, and kind of obvious too, because if you think about it, if you have a multitude of people, multitude of nations, they're going to have to migrate. They can't all live in Palestine. You cannot have a multitude of nations in Palestine uh, or in the Israel area over there today. You have to have a multitude of land to house the multitude of nations and the multitude of kings. Uh, just, it's simple math. So, 
Here we have that they're going to migrate to the north, south, east, and west. So these are going to be a maritime people, you could say, because they're going to migrate all over the globe, you could say, all over the world. And they're going to go north, south, east, and west. So that's an identification mark of these people. They're going to travel to all, all over the place. And they're going to set up these multitude of nations promised, obviously. Now, later on in this verse, we have also another thing. It says, The seed in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now we know, as Christians, we know that the main promise... A fulfillment of that promise is in through Jesus Christ in the gospel. King Jesus at that. And He is the promise that has blessed all the families of the earth. His gospel has blessed all the families of the earth. But we also have promises of... We have the Israel people themselves fulfilling this promise through blessing all the families of the earth through other means as well. Now, I'm not going to focus on that, but I think those listening are smart enough to think about the things that the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, and Scandinavian people have done versus the Jewish people, the, the, the church, and which were made up mainly of those people through the last 1900 years. And just think about how they have blessed the world. Uh, one blessing is just this Bible right here. But Jesus being the ultimate fulfillment of that, uh, being the the one that truly blessed all the families of the earth through the seed of Abraham. Now, let's move on. Uh, actually, real quick, I want to read... Um, I want to give you two other verses, and you can look this up on your own because of time. But Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, and Genesis chapter 32, 12. These verses are similar to the ones concerning the dust, and they can use the stars of the heaven as being an example of how numerous uh, Israel's descendants are going to be. Just another example of how. Now, when it comes to this subject... That seems very clear. The multitude of people, multitude of nations through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, and then the Israelites. Now ask yourself, through these three schools of thought that we just discussed, which school of thought, in your mind, would make up a multitude of people, a multitude of nations, a multitude of kings through history? Now, the Jewish people today, they make up a very small minority of people. That is by their own admission. They keep very good records, uh, very good genealogy records, very good uh, historical records, and population records. Um, they are a very small minority. They have never, you can look it up, never been a multitude of nations. Never have. And some people think they will in the future, but you know these promises were made a very long time ago. And are we to say that they haven't been fulfilled? Was God lying to Abraham when he says, I will make you a multitude of nations? Think about it. Now, through the Jewish people today, they do not have a multitude of nations. The only nation that they can honestly claim, and not even honestly because we as a, other, other nations prop them up, claim to be their nation is the Israeli state um, established in 1947. That's one nation, okay? So it took, you know, 3,000 years, 4,000 years for uh, them to establish one nation after, well, actually, it have been a little bit more, less than that if you include uh, the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. But still, it took that long. It's still, that's not a multitude of nations. So, it does not make sense that the Jewish school of thought would fulfill these promises. Now, what about the church school of thought, spiritual Israel? Well, that there's a lot, a whole subject in that right there itself. But they are not a physical people as spoken about in these passages. Yes, they are physical flesh and blood, but these promises were made to a physical flesh and blood people, not a spiritual people. And the church has, has never made up a multitude of nations, a multitude of people, and a multitude of kings in the way that this passage is speaking of. So it can't be that one. So, let me ask you this. The Anglo-Saxon people, Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, and Celtic, and kindred people who migrated northwest through the Caucasus Mountains 
after the Assyrian captivity, lost their identity. They, they weren't lost. They'd forgotten their identity, more like it. Uh, you know, many call them the lost tribes of Israel. No, they were the forgotten tribes of Israel. They had forgotten their identity because God said that's what was going to happen. He cast them off. But there was promises in place for that as well, we'll discuss, where they would be brought back in. But those people, have they made, honestly ask yourself this, have those people made a multitude of nations, a multitude of people, and a multitude of kings? Has Europe not produced kings throughout its history? Has the Anglo-Saxon people not produced a large amount of people, population, throughout its history? Have they not produced a multitude of nations? Have they not traveled to the north, south, east, and west? And through their innovations, have they not blessed all the families of the earth? Have they not taken the gospel to the entire world through their migrations, north, south, east, and west? I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to let you answer that. Just something to think about and chew on for a minute. Now, before we go on, let's look at some history, biblical history, of the Israelites. Now, I'm going to be skimming over a lot of it, and I expect you to take notes and go back and check and see what I'm saying is so. But we're just going to review some history through, through the Bible. Now, we know that Abraham were given these promises, and through his seed, Isaac, his son, and then his son, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, the promises were given to. And then Jacob's sons, or Jacob Israel's sons, the twelve sons of Jacob, were these promises to be administered through. Now, um, sometimes we're often hear the twelve tribes of Israel, and sometimes we'll hear the thirteen tribes of Israel. That is because Joseph's sons, his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, had a, a, had a half inheritance. And they became uh, what was known, they were made up of the thirteen tribes of Israel because of that. That's a whole other story, but just wanted to add that in there in case there's some confusion. So those people made up the 12 tribes of Israel. They, their families made up, and that's where you get the 12 tribes of Israel. And then after that, they went into captivity into Egypt, like God had promised, or promised and showed Abraham back in Genesis. And they went into captivity for about, well, from the time of uh, their, the true captivity, about 200 years. But from the time from Canaan to the Exodus, 400 years. But after that, they were brought out by God through the Exodus, using Moses and the plagues, and they had the, going across in the Red Sea, and then they came to Mount Sinai. Now this is where we have some very important history, because God came down and He made a covenant, another covenant, with the Israel people. This is often called the Mosaic Covenant, or the Old Covenant. And this was a conditional covenant, not an unconditional like the Abrahamic Covenant. The Israelites had to follow a certain set of laws and rituals, and you had to keep them perfectly, or you could lose the covenant. You, you Basically, it was a marriage contract. And they had to follow the contract, and if they failed it, they would lose the contract, so to speak. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, and we're going to read a portion of that story. And it says here, Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they unto the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Raphtim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness. And Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, thou shalt, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I have done did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be a, unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
And these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of Israel, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So, we have the Israelites here basically saying, I do, like we do in a marriage ceremony, uh, or I will. They were agreeing to the terms of the covenant. And they took the covenant, and they were bound to it, legally in a sense. And um, like I said, it wasn't unlike to a marriage covenant. They had to obey it and keep it. And if not, there was, there was conditions, curses that would happen to them. And you can read about those in Deuteronomy 28. Now, like I said, do not confuse this with the Abrahamic covenant, which was unconditional. This is a conditional covenant. Now, this is what is known as the first national covenant of Israel. And they had to keep the law, statutes, and judgments of God perfectly for righteousness' sake. Two different covenants, two different, one conditional and one unconditional. Now we're going to pass over hundreds of years of history here. And the Israelites, they had a lot of turbulent times from this point on. Um, they did a lot of evil in the sight of the Lord. They rebelled. And God cursed them and punished them throughout that time. And then we come up, you know, from the time of Moses to King Solomon, they were one nation. They were bound together, one nation. But after that point, the northern house of Israel, they split in two. And you'll see it on the screen. I'll put a map up there where you can see it. They split in two, and you had the northern house of Israel and the southern house of Judah, the southern nation of Judah and the uh, northern nation of Israel. The northern nation of Israel made up the, about ten tribes and fragments of other tribes as well. And they were basically at odds with one another. They, they clashed and fought and it was just a bitter civil war you could say. And then those people in the northern house, they just kept rebelling and rebelling and rebelling against God. Not that the southern house wasn't. And God eventually cast them out. He divorced them. He divorced them from their marriage contract and He put them into captivity. He sent them off. And the Assyrian Empire, which was a massive empire at that time, they came down with several different attacks. And they um, battled with the northern house and attacked and carried them away to captivity. You can read about this in 2 Kings uh, 17, 6 through 18, and 18, 11 through 12 along with 2 Kings 15, 29 through there, the different skirmishes. It didn't happen all in one day. It happened over a period of years. Now, in spite of all this, the southern house of Judah, they saw all this going on and they did not take heed. They were worse than their northern brother or sister. They were worse. God, God didn't divorce Judah. Now, he's going to punish him here in a minute, but he did not divorce her because he had promises that he had to keep through Judah. It's very important. There was a Messiah promised, and he had to keep those promises, and it had to come th through Judah. Now, the northern house of Israel was hauled off into captivity into Assyria, and then the southern house was hauled off to Babylon. Now, if you read about King, uh, Daniel and that time there in Babylon, that is when the Judeans, the Judites, were taken to Babylon into captivity. But a remnant of Judah was then brought back or came back to what we know as Palestine, and those are the those people that returned there were the ancestors of the Israelite Judahites that were there during the time of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' ancestors were among those people that came back. So we have a small we have a, the northern house of Israel going up to the north, and then we have Judah, the majority of Judah going to Babylon, and then a remnant of Judah coming back to uh, Palestine. And there was many different invasions at this time. Now, you have to understand, the northern house of Israel, 
millions and millions of people. And there was a lot of different um, skirmishes at that time, but some people will teach you when this is brought up that the northern house of Israel came back to Palestine with Judah around the same time. This is impossible because then it would make God a liar because He promised what He was going to do to those people. And He said that He was going to cast them off. Read Deuteronomy 28, 15, verse 15 through 68. He was going to cast them off. They were going into the wilderness. And those people there, if you bring them back to Judah, and there's other issues with that as well. I did a message on it not that long ago. Uh, you can go to Christian American Ministries on YouTube and look it up uh, under um, uh, Forgotten Tribes or Lost Tribes. Uh, and I touch on that in the verses in Ezra that are often used as proof texts. Text. So these people, they didn't migrate back. They migrated north, and they lost their identity. They were forgotten. They became heathens. They lost their God. They, they, were, they were scattered. And they went by different names, and they migrated northwest. Now, at this time, I'm going to be playing a clip from a documentary that was um, aired on t television in the 1990s. The documentary is um, put together by the late pastor Peter J. Peters, and he is interviewing biblical archaeologist E. Raymond Cap. Now, biblical archaeologist E. Raymond Cap has wrote numerous books on this subject, one being one that I highly recommend that will go into more detail of what he's going to speak about in this clip. But Missing Links Discovered in Assyrian Tablets. I highly recommend this book by e, uh, biblical archaeologist E. Raymond Cap. Uh, it goes into the history that he is about to say in this clip. So without further ado, watch this clip and then I will return and we will discuss more concerning who Israel is today. Where once there was a man by the name of Abraham, who God said was going to father a multitude of people, many nations, and of course, the question that is before us at this portion of the program is what happened to those people that were destined to form a multitude of nations, people taken into Assyrian captivity. And though the Bible seems to be quiet at a certain spot about it, the archaeological record, I understand, Mr. Cap, is not. Does it give us yes, any clues? Archaeology has found the answer. I'd like you to share the answer and with my audience. And secular historians have really found no mention of the exiled Israelites in ancient records. We now know the reason why. It was simply because the Assyrians did not call them by the right name. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, why don't you show the audience some of the slide presentations that you brought with you so that uh, right. they can kind of see what you have spent a lifetime or a major portion of your life studying. Okay, happy to. That should be on there. We're going to start our search for the lost tribes where they were last reported to be located. That is in ancient Assyria and Media. Now, this is in northern modern Iraq and Iran. Our first clue to the ultimate fate of the lost tribes was found by the archaeologists in excavating the Assyrian Royal Library at Nineveh. That is in the ruins of the palace of uh, Sargon II. They were in the form of cuneiform tablets, such as you see here. These were actually uncovered over a century ago, translated in 1930 by Professor Waterman of the University of Michigan. But their relevance to Israel was completely overlooked. This was because they were in complete disorder among some other 1,400 other texts, and no Israel words or names appeared. One tablet, dated 707 B.C., referred to a land called Gumir, which was occupied by people called Gumira or Gimera. Now this was a very area the Israelites had been placed just 14 years previously. Gamir, we believe, is evidently a corruption of Gomri, the Assyrian name for Israel, formed by the inversion of the final uh, syllable I-R to R, I should say R-I to I-R. Such inversions are very common in Assyrian writings. These tablets were actually spy reports sent to the Assyrian king from a frontier post, the king being that time was Sargon. These reports covered a large period of time. That's fascinating. Now, these reports, what did they say? Well, among other things, they reported that the exiled Israelites were not slaves. 
They were actually freemen. Had their own homes, their cities, towns, uh, engaged in various activities. They had agriculture, manufacture. Would you believe they even had their own standing army? Now this is, sounds strange, but consider the fact why were the Israelites in Assyria? Now Assyria in the past, any time they occupied, I should say, subjected an area, they merely sent their overseers there to extract a tribute and so on. But with the Israelites, this is an ex exception. They brought these men up to Assyria to act as buffers around the borders of the country. In other words, these, evidently they were fierce fighters in those days. Well, what do you mean, buffers? Well, for instance, any outside invasion coming directed toward Assyria, they'd have to penetrate first through the Israelite lines. That means the Israelites would have to fight for their lives, either repulse the enemy or at least, uh, you might say, weaken them before they got to Assyria proper. Now, we can prove this because uh, one series of tablets uh, reported the invasion of Uratu, the king of Uratu, came against Assyria, and they had to penetrate first through the Israelites. Now, one of the tablets makes it very clear the Israelites put up resistance, they fought, actually repulsed the armies, and then turned around and invaded Uratu in, in exchange. In fact, they not only uh, captured or killed, see, all their army commanders, they even sacked the country. Now, archaeologists had known for years the that capital of Sar uh, in Uratu had been sacked and destroyed. They never knew who did it. Now, the tablets for the first time reveal these were Israelites that did it. It's fascinating. You know, it makes sense, too, that uh, they would set them there because, in other words, if there's an invading army, they're going to have to come through their land, so they've got to defend their own land that they're working, their families, and that type of thing. That's interesting. Another and later Assyrian report states, in the second year of Ursa Hayden the king, now this is about 679 B.C., the Gimera, as the Israelites were then called, rose in rebellion under their leader, Tuespa. We don't know if Tuespa was a woman or a man at this stage. They fled westward. Now, the Greeks reported these same activities. They called the Gimera, Kimeroi, in their records. Now, that name is translated into English as Kimerians. Now, the branch of Israelites, now known as Kimerians, moved out of Major Minor, around and sometimes across the Black Sea, settling in the Crimea and the Carpathian regions west of the Black Sea. We find this called in 2nd Ezra, our Sereth, or Mountains of Sereth. Now, later when Babylon conquered the Assyrian Empire, this is about see, 612 B.C., they then invaded that part of Media where the Israelites, or Gimera, had, that had not escaped, were still there, and settled. And that, of course, drove the Gimera out of their area, some of them moving up through the uh, Caucasus, uh, through the, what we call today the Pass of Israel. I should say that some historians refer to that as the Pass of Israel. Others moved around the uh, east of the Caspian Sea and became known as Iskuzi, a name very easily derived from Isaac. Then these tablets that allow us to learn these things really provide a very valuable archaeological clue, don't they? Yes, they do. There's another major clue to tracing the lost is tribes of Israel. is found on the side of a hill in northern Persia. It's in inscribed writings about 300 feet above the base of the mountain, the hill. Now, the inscriptions were actually carved in Akkadian, Elamite and old Persian languages. All three told the same story. The inscriptions show that the Babylonian name Gimera was written Saka on the Persian inscription, proving that the Gimera and the Saka were the same people. Now, the Greeks called these Scythians, I should say they called the Saka, Scythians in all their records. This is the first mention of the word Scythian. It's also interesting to note that the various names Gimera are called all have the same root S.K. as Isaac. Now, before the tribes went into exile, they called themselves the house of Isaac. You can find this in the Bible in Amos 4, verses 7 and 16, I believe. Archaeology has not only identified these Scythians as members of the lost tribes of Israel, but for the first time provided us with realistic, lifelike pictures of what the ancient Hebrews people looked like. Now, unlike the stylized uh, pictures we see the Egyptians made and formalized or stylized stone carvings uh, made by the Babylonians and Persians, excavated from Scythian tombs north of Caucasus are found skillfully made gold work showing the everyday life of the Scythians. Here are two Scythian horsemen are astride their horses. Two Scythians here are fighting back to back using bows and arrows. Now, this reminds us of the little tribe of Benjamin that had, according to the Bible, 
280,000 men of valor that bore shields and drew the bow. Now to continue tracing the Israelites, under pressure from the Medes and the Persians, the Scythians, now this is the eastern branch of the Israelites, they migrated north of the Black Sea, coming into collision with the Cimmerians. Now the Cimmerians, I consider them the western branch of the Israelites. These people had settled in the Carpathian regions. Now their kinship lost during the passing centuries, ensuing battles ended with the Cimmerians being pushed out of the area and they moved, moved westward. The Cimmerians then broke into two major groups. The larger part migrating up the Danube River Valley, arriving at its source in South Germany between 600 and 100 BC. Now Roman historians, they call these people Celts. This is the first mention now, the word Celt. A small group moved into the sparsely inhabited regions of the Baltic, but the Romans called them by the abbreviated name of Cimbri. Now between the fourth and first centuries BC, the Sarmatians, now these are a mixed non-Israelitish people, we believe partly Iranian, were pushing westward. They finally moved into the area of the then prosperous Scythian nation. Continuing warfare then drove the Scythians out of their land, as they had done the Cimmerians, and the majority northward toward the Baltic areas. Now by the end of the second century BC, we find only two small pockets of Scythians left on the shores of the Black Sea. Now, the Scythians in turn pushed the Cimbri westward to Jutland and the coast of Holland. Now during this period of time, the Celts were expanding in all directions, many of them pouring into Britain to form the bedrock of the British race. About uh, 3000 BC, uh, some of the Celts invaded Italy and sacked Rome. Others migrated back into Asia Minor but they, they were called Galatians by the Greeks. We now know that Paul's letters to the Galatians were to his kinsmen Israelites, that is, descendants of the earlier Galatians, although called Gentiles by the modern Bible translators. You know, that really helps to clear up to a degree, or major degree, this term Gentile. A lot of people have a lot of problems with it, mm -hmm. but the word itself is ethnos, and it means nations. That's right. And what you're talking about here are nations, and of course God told Abraham, his seed was going to form a multitude of nations. Those nations would definitely be Israelites. Now, as the Sarmatians occupied Scythia in South Russia, there was a tendency to confuse them with the Sarmatians, because people are usually identified by the name of the land they live in. Now, the Romans, they solved the problem. They introduced the word Germans for Scythians. Now, the word uh, genuine, or genuous, uh, genuine, I should say, is Germanus or Germani. That's the Latin word for genuine. So in all the Roman records, except for a few outland areas, they dropped the name Scythian in all the Roman records. They applied the word Sarmatians or Germans. Now from that, well, I guess you get, you get the picture. Oh, no, it's fascinating, yes. Now don't think for a minute we're talking about the German nation today. Right. The uh, Cimbri were eventually driven out of Northwest Europe. One group migrated to Italy, were nearly all wiped out by the Romans. One group made their way back into Spain to be known as Ibrius. Now, Ibrius is the Gaelic name for Hebrews. And eventually, many of those migrated into uh, the Ireland as Scots. They named the island Hibernia, that early name for Ireland, a name that still exists. One group crossed the English Channel into northern Britain to form the, I should say, put the, form the roots of the nation of the Picts. Now, during the succeeding centuries, the Scythian Germanic peoples broke into many divisions, possibly in some instances into their original Israel tribal families, like the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Danes, and Vikings, to name just a few. Now between 450 and 600 AD, some of the Angles and Saxons moved into Britain as Anglo-Saxons. The Celtic Scots, for the most part, moved into northern Britain and established the nation of Scotland although some settled in northern Wales, the Isles of Man, the Scilly Islands. Now many Germanic tribes poured into the land south, that is, after the Celts began to move out and vacate the land. These Germanic tribes established the Gothic nations, the Vandals, Lombards, Franks, Burgundians, Visigoths, Ostrogoths. These Scythian Germanic people, or tribes, formed the modern German, Swiss, French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese nations of the day. 
although there has been over the centuries an infusion of non-Israel blood in these nations. The northern Scythian Israelites that had settled in Scandinavia, we read of them in history, raiding and establishing colonies in Western Europe, Britain, and Ireland. One group settled in France became known as Normans, who later forced their way into England under William the Conqueror in 1066. What happened to the lost tribes of Israel? You now know the answer. They were never really lost. They only lost their identity as they migrated over the centuries westward. You see, there's truly no such thing as the lost tribes of Israel. They were not lost, but they were forgotten. They've forgotten their identity. These Israelites have even been forgotten up to this day. They are still fulfilling the promises that they were given, their blood right, their inheritance, but they have forgotten their identity. I want you to turn to Jeremiah 31, 31. And this is a very important passage. It's one of my favorite passages because it promises the new covenant. And the new covenant that was promised with the house of Israel and the house of Judah after they were divorced, after the northern house was divorced and Judah was punished. But it says here in Jeremiah 31, 31, through 33. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be, and will be their God and they shall be my people. God Almighty came in the flesh in the form of Jesus Christ to redeem His people, Israel. It was, he was the husbandman that came to redeem them, which redeem means buy back, by the way. You can't redeem anything that you did not already possess. And if you read through Scripture, God, Israel was considered a possession, a God, a treasure, a God, a peculiar, which means special in the King James language, treasure unto God. And that language is all littered out through the Old Testament. But Jesus Christ came, in, He was God in flesh. If you don't believe that, read John 1, uh, the entire chapter. He came in the flesh to redeem His people. And at this point in Israel's history, we've already covered the marriage, the rebellion, the scattering and divorce, and the promises of redemption, of hope. And now we move up a couple centuries later to chapter, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Let's, let's read that real quick. Luke chapter 2. And it says here in verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him." Now you see here, Israel was cut off. The northern house of Israel was cut off, but there was promises made with the New Covenant. There was still hope. Can you imagine the Israelites that were cut off if they were able to realize how there was no hope? But then Jeremiah, you know, they would have been cut off from this knowledge. That they, were, they would have been cut off from the promises. But Jeremiah in, was given, and other passages as well in the Old Testament, the promise that God said, Hey, I'm going to make a new covenant with the same people that I made at Mount Sinai. Now, you can't get around that. The new covenant was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It wasn't made with everybody in the world. If you don't believe me, Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8.8. 8. Hebrews 8.8 8 is refer, uh, quoting that passage we just read in Jeremiah 31. And it clearly says, I am making a covenant with the same people that I made before. But it was a better covenant. And this covenant was made with the spilling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He was the perfect sacrifice that initiated this covenant. Now let's read Luke chapter 1. 
We're kind of going backwards. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. And this is speaking of the father of John the Baptist, Zacharias. And it says here, and let's read verse 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. That is a beautiful verse because it's one of my favorites. Because let me ask you this, who visited his people? Well, God did, right? Who else? Who redeemed his people? Well, most Christians would know the answer to that. It was Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? God in the flesh. The God of Israel was the same God that married Israel at Mount Sinai. Jesus Christ, who redeemed Israel, is the same God that married them. There wasn't two gods working here. There's only one. Jesus Christ is the same God Almighty in the Old Testament. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You also know who, when you hear terms like His people, who's it speaking of? It's speaking of Israel. Now, it's important to note that there is only one people in Scripture known as God's people, and that is Israel. You can't get around that. There's also one people known as His, his sheep, as the elect. And it falls under the Israelites. And that doesn't mean every Israelite is saved. I'm not saying that. But there was a covenant made with the Israelites, and that's what's important. And I, I'll, well, I'll, I'll check on that here in a minute when we get to the end. But I also want to turn to um, let's turn to Matthew chapter one real quick. Matthew chapter one. Just to affirm what I just stated. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And it says here, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt his name, excuse me, shalt that call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You see, Jesus, he came in the flesh to save his people, us, from our sins. We were cut off, we were lost. Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. And for those out there that are watching this, if you're not Christian and you do not know Jesus, pray. Get to know Him. Be a Christian. Believe. Have faith. Be baptized for the remission of sins and then live on in faith in the Christian way. Because Jesus died on that cross for those people 2,000 years ago, but He also died for those people today as well. It's very important. So, at this point, we have a new covenant being made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Sometime in the future, and we know that it was at the, at the cross, but at the time of Jeremiah, it was in the future. And the promise of a Redeemer, and then Jesus arrives, and He saves His people from their sins. And just like Moses had to ratify and seal the covenant, the old covenant, with by the taking of blood on the altar. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 24. Likewise, Jesus Christ, upon the cross, had to shed His blood for the new covenant, the ratification of the new covenant. And in Luke 22, 22 20, it says this, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new testament, or the new covenant, in my blood, which is shed for you. You see, this was right before Jesus died, and this is when they were taking communion for the first time. And he's saying, this blood that I'm about to shed is shed for you, for the new covenant. What new covenant? The new covenant promised in Jeremiah 31, 31, the, the new covenant quoted by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 8.8. 8. Jesus was the fulfillment of this new covenant, the beginning of this new covenant. And there was hope in Israel yet again. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Let's turn there real quick. 
It says here, But the precious blood of Jesus, excuse me, the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. You see, that blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ was what initiated that new covenant. For us, the one we're under today, those that are Christian, and like I said, for those that don't want to give the authority to the Old Testament, read Hebrews 8. The author of Hebrews 8 is reiterating that. Now, if we believe Jesus came to redeem His people and ratify the new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, then we must believe that these people would fulfill the promises and will be to them a God, and they shall be a people unto me. Now, that's in Jeremiah 31. Let me ask you this. What people throughout the last 2,000 years have been a people unto, the, unto God, and served Him. Now, I'm not talking about as a whole. I'm talking about as a remnant. You know, you can't say every person that is a flesh and blood Israelite is holy. It wasn't that way back then. It isn't that way today. But as a whole, who throughout the history in the last 2,000 years have been a God, or have, have admired Him as a God and followed Him and been a people unto Him, and it was the Anglo-Saxon people. They followed Him. Like I said, we wouldn't have this Bible if it wasn't for them. And this is no message of racial pride. Do not get me wrong. I'm not speaking a, a message of racial pride or anything like that. Historical fact. Are these people Israel or are they not? Because this isn't a message of racial pride. We have another mission, not pride. Pride goeth before destruction. We, you know, a lot of people will take this message, that believe this message, and they'll run with it as a message of racial pride. That is wrong. We are not to live in our pride. We have a bigger mission. Bigger mission. And the Anglo-Saxon people, they need to be a servant people to the Lord. And they have been, but we are really needing it today. Now, the gospel they took to the world... They took the Word of God in the form of the Bible and invented the printing press and gave it to everybody. I mean, this phone right here. Hundreds of Bible translations on one phone. Concordances, lexicons, I can do a word study on one word like that. Can you imagine what the Reformers during the Reformation when they were being hunted? Or in the first century. You know, the, the manuscripts that we have today that we make uh, that would become our Bible, those people were being hunted and murdered for that. We need to remember that. But we have a focus. It's not a message of pride. It's not a focus of pride. But we are to be ambassadors. The Israelites of the world are to be ambassadors of Christ. They are to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God here on earth. And that's a start with Israel. We're to be a light of the world and a salt of the earth. That's what we need to do. That is what we need to do. We don't need to have this, this haughty spirit. We need to get out and get to work and be servants to the Lord Jesus Christ and do His will on this earth. Now, the main focus of Jesus Christ's ministry while He was here on earth was what? Do you know? Was it to sign this little sinner's prayer card and, and, and be a Christian? Like so many churches out there act like that's the entire gospel? No. It was the focus of the kingdom of God. The very first words that he said when he, after his, um, after his baptism and his ministry had began was, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then 40 days after his death, burial, and resurrection, what did he preach about? It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that he preached for 40 days concerning the kingdom of God. Now, he preached 40 days on something that most people sum up on the back of the I'll go to heaven card. I think he was preaching more than what we think. There was much more to this kingdom than we, we think it is. If not, there wouldn't be so many parables and teachings that Jesus was teaching us about. 
Jesus and the apostles all preached that the kingdom of God was at hand. And then they stopped using that at-hand business after the cross, after Pentecost. And they went forth boldly. You know, you read the book of Acts, in Acts 17, they were being drug out of houses because how dare they say that there's another king, king named Jesus. They were challenging the authorities of the day. They were preaching another king. Not one king, not one god out of the many that the Greeks had and the Romans had at that time. They were teaching one. Uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 7, and let's uh, finish up real quick. It says here, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not unto the way of the Gentiles, and enter into any city of Samaritan, 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 enter ye not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, or at near. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. It says here, And if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, or devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Let me ask you, if we say the kingdom of God has not come, then we have to admit that Jesus Christ was casting out devils in the name of Beelzebub because of what he said in Matthew chapter 12. Right? Think about that. You can go back and read it again a couple times. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. The kingdom of God was established in the first century. Is it perfect? No. Mainly because us stiff-necked Israelites are sitting away waiting to be raptured off to heaven rather than to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God here on this earth. We let the, he the world go to hell in a handbasket and do nothing. We sit around and do nothing. We let our communities go, our families go, our country go, and we do nothing about it. Think about it. You know what I'm talking about. This is no mystery. How many Christians do you know that are scummy people that sit around and do nothing? They call themselves Christians, but they do nothing because they're waiting to just die and go to heaven. This world's not my own home. And then they'll sing, I'll fly away, O glory, on Sunday morning. That is not the Christian way. That is not being the salt of the earth and the light to the world. Think about that. Salt is a preservant. We're to preserve justice and the righteousness of God in this earth, yet we're just letting it run rampant. This is our mission. Advancing the kingdom of God as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. This is not a message of racial pride or Israelite pride, or whatever you want to call it. It is a message of racial... Actually, it's not a message of racial superiority, but rather a superior responsibility racially as Israelites. Think about that for a minute. A superior responsibility. Israelites have a responsibility that other people do not. We need to get up off our couches and get to work like we are Israelites. And for those out there that understand they are Israel, get to work. Don't just sit there. Get to work. It's our mission. It's our mission. We are to perfect the kingdom of God on this earth, and we're to get to work and serve Him, please Him. And that is very, very important. One last scripture, and then I'll close. One last scripture. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And His righteousness. Are you, as a Christian, seeking the righteousness of God? Are you seeking the kingdom of God in the here and now? It's very important for us to do that. We need to get up off our butts and get to work promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ in this earth. The enemies of Jesus Christ, they're promoting their kingdom out there. They're promoting their kingdom, and they are good at it. They evangelize, they have their ambassadors, their preachers, their, their, 
They're very good at it. But Christians, they have dropped the ball. We need to do this for our children's sake. Because the enemies of Christ, they would love nothing more to see all of us gone. And the Christian way dem demolished. In fact, that's what they're working for. But it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But why wait? Why wait for the next generation to do it? Well, your children are suffering now. While they're being taught horrible things in the public schools and in the, the nation that we live in today, let's get to work. Promote the kingdom of God in this earth and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our mission as Israelites, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now let's do it. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more, um, I encourage you to get some books. I'm going to recommend some books real quick of this message because this was in a nutshell. It was super quick. First one I would recommend would be Discover your, uh, the History of Your Biblical Inheritance, Book 1 by Dr. Lawrence Blanchard. Really good book, good foundational information. Get it, read it, and then get Book 2, 3, and 4 as well. Very good book. Highly recommend it. Um, that is Discover the, History, the Story of Your Biblical Inheritance by Dr. Lawrence Blanchard. You also can, uh, I recommend this because Gentile, the word Gentile, there's a lot of questions around it. Mystery of the Gentiles by Ted R. Wyland, really good book. You can actually read this online for free at his website. Just go to missiontoisrael.org and you can read it along with the uh, companion book to it, God's Covenant People Yesterday, Today, and Forever. Excellent book. Um, highly recommend both of those books. And then if you want to hear if you want a book about the history of maybe some of the people that believe that the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, and Scandinavian, and Celtic, and kindred people were the Israel people, and it was more than you think, and some of them very, very notable, I recommend Who Hath Believed Our Report by Pastor Charles Jennings. This is a history book, basically, of uh, different writings from different notable men who believe this message, and he just compiled it into a book with a history of it. And this isn't all of it. It's a very small portion of the history. I mean, you can have volumes of it. But I highly recommend that book there. Also, if you go to my website, ChristianAmericanMinistries.org, I have written a series of tracks um, answering some of the objections to the Israel message, because there's all kinds of them. What about the woman at the well? What about um, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, and so on? And I've written some of those. I've written one here. What about the woman of Samaria? You can read that for free, print them off, give them to people. Uh, my newest one is, Yeah, but the Bible says neither Jew nor Greek. Really good one. Uh, I think that you'll find it a blessing. Uh, I have another one. Anglo-Israel truth, is it a new doctrine? And this one is kind of a very, very short version of what Pastor Jennings had put in that book, but it lays out some of the documentation that people that believe this message prior to um, what we think today is a new doctrine. And then two more, um, the Gospel, a love story, and then who are the Israelites? Uh, just a basic Israelite identity track. You can read all those at my website for free. And uh, thank you all for watching, and I encourage you to go to my website and YouTube channel and learn some more about this, because I know in this message it was short, sweet, and to the point, but I pray that it was a blessing to you. Until next time, thank you for watching.